We are focusing today on one of the highest stakes procedures in medicine emergent airway management. Absolutely. A really critical skill. And we're breaking down the evidence comparing direct laryngoscopy and video laryngoscopy. That's right. This is uh, an examination of the clinical data. Airway management, it's high risk. Yeah, definitely. We really need to synthesize the evidence, you know, define the specific advantages and risks of each technique. The stakes are just enormous, aren't they? Studies show the complication risk for endotracheal intubation in the intensive care unit can be up to 39%. 39%. It's high. That's nearly four out of every 10 procedures facing an immediate complication. It's quite sobering. Correct. And before we even start comparing the two, we have to remember the... Uh, the professional mandate here. Which is? Providers really should be highly proficient in both direct laryngoscopy and video laryngoscopy. Competence that has to drive your choice in the moment. Not just what you used last time. Exactly. Not simple familiarity. You need skill in both. Okay, let's start with minimizing risk then. Why is getting it right on the very first attempt so important in emergent intubation? Well, first attempt success is probably the single biggest factor for patient safety. Okay. The source material we looked at shows that even with just one single attempt, the complication rate is already sitting at 14.2%. 14.2%. That's your baseline risk right from the start. That's the baseline. And if that first attempt fails, it seems like things escalate quickly. Well, absolutely. That initial failure, it sets off this cascade of uh, exponentially increasing danger. How bad does it get? If a provider has to make four or more attempts, the complication rate just explodes. It jumps to an astounding 70.6%. 70.6, wow, that's that's a massive jump. Think about that, from 14.2% up to 70.6%. The relationship is, well, it's unambiguous. So more attempts, much higher risk. Complication incidence increases dramatically as the number of attempts climbs. Yeah. Reducing the number of times you insert the blade is just paramount. And what's the most common, maybe the most devastating complication we're trying to avoid when attempts pile up like that? Uh, oxygen desaturation. That's the big one. Right. Losing the airway means losing oxygenation. I mean, the entire goal of this procedure is to prevent that. The more attempts you make, the more time you spend uh, not ventilating effectively, and the higher the risk of critical desaturation becomes. Okay, that really sets the scene for why this matters so much. Now let's look at performance. For providers who are already experts, let's say those with significant experience, how do the two techniques compare in just overall success rate? Yeah, that's interesting. When we focus only on highly experienced intubators, people who've done, say, over 50 successful endotracheal intubations. Okay. The success rates are actually incredibly similar. Direct laryngoscopy comes in at 92.8% success. 92.8. Pretty high. Very high. And video laryngoscopy shows maybe a slight edge at 95.8%. And 95.8. So really, for an expert, both tools are highly effective. That's right. That 3% difference. Yeah. It's probably negligible in the hands of a specialist. But what about speed? You know, in the emergency department, every single second counts. Which tool is demonstrably faster during an emergent intubation? Ah, speed. Okay, here. Direct laryngoscopy seems to hold the advantage. It does. Yes. Studies in the emergency department show direct laryngoscopy had a median time of 30 seconds to successful placement. 30 seconds. Okay. And video laryngoscopy? It clocked in slower at a median time of 42 seconds. 42 seconds. So that's a 12-second difference, median time. That could be significant. Could be. Yeah. This is likely because, well, the direct laryngoscopy technique might require less manipulation, perhaps. Why? Less setup than positioning a screen or, you know, optimizing that camera view. Right. It's a more direct line of sight. Less complex tech, maybe. Precisely. Direct laryngoscopy offers that more direct line of sight and less complex technology to manage, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. But speed, as you said, is just one part of the equation. Okay. We really have to look at the quality of the time spent, especially in certain situations. Right. So let's move to probably the highest pressure scenario there is. Patients undergoing cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR. Yes. This is where the quality of compression time is absolutely everything. How does the choice of airway technique impact those vital chest compressions? This, I think, is the most profound advantage we see for video laryngoscopy in the data. It's vastly superior in minimizing chest compression interruptions. Minimizing interruptions, why is that so critical? Well, interruptions equal zero blood flow to the brain and heart. Any pause in compressions is potentially detrimental. And the data here is quite stark, isn't it? 
Tell us the median total compression interruption time you found for video laryngoscopy. Okay, get this. The median total compression interruption time was 0, 0.0 seconds with video laryngoscopy. Zero. Seriously. Zero seconds median interruption. The provider is able to visualize and navigate the airway without demanding a total stop to chest compressions, or at least minimizing it dramatically. Wow. Okay, contrast that zero interruption time with the standard approach using direct laryngoscopy during CPR. With direct laryngoscopy, it logged a median interruption time of 4.0 seconds. Four seconds median pause in compressions. Four seconds. Now, four seconds might not sound like a huge amount of time in daily life. No. But when a patient is in cardiac arrest, that is absolutely critical time lost. This zero flow time really dictates viability. The sources also mention something called serious no flow, defined as any interruption greater than 10 seconds. Does one technique manage to eliminate that catastrophic risk entirely? Yes, it does. Serious no flow, that interruption lasting longer than 10 seconds. It never occurred with video laryngoscopy in the studies we reviewed. Never occurred, so the rate was 0%. 0%, that's a major clinical finding. Absolutely. So then, if a provider uses direct laryngoscopy during active CPR, what is the risk of hitting one of those serious, greater than 10 second no flow periods? Well, serious no flow occurred with direct laryngoscopy in 26.1% of the cases studied. 26.1%, so over a quarter of the time. Over one quarter of the time, the procedure using direct laryngoscopy during CPR stopped blood flow for too long over 10 seconds. That number, I think, makes the immediate benefit of video laryngoscopy during resuscitation really undeniable. It certainly seems like video laryngoscopy is the clear winner in that specific critical scenario. But yeah. what about the environment, the actual conditions you're working in? When might direct laryngoscopy be the necessary, reliable choice? Right. That's the other side of the coin. Direct laryngoscopy shines when the airway is contaminated. Contaminated? Like how? With blood or thick fluids like vomitus. Direct laryngoscopy visualization is purely optical. It's just your eye looking down the blade. So it's not hampered by fogging or fluids as much? Exactly. Yeah. It offers superior reliability in a chaotic, contaminated airway scenario where a camera lens might get obscured. Ah, okay. That's the trade-off with the technology then, isn't it? Video laryngoscopy relies on that camera lens at the end. Personally. What happens when that technology gets compromised by, say, blood or vomit? Well, the glottic view is immediately disturbed if the lens is obscured. If there's contamination right on the camera, you lose your picture. You lose your visualization or it's severely impaired. Direct laryngoscopy provides that essential backup, that reliability, when the technology, the camera, is obscured by debris or fluids. That makes perfect sense. You get that mechanical, unfiltered sight, regardless of the mess. Are there any tools now that sort of bridge this divide, maybe offer both functions? Absolutely. Some modern tools, like the uh, CMEC video laryngoscopy system, for example, okay. they're designed to function as both. You can use the video screen, but yeah. if it fails or the camera lens gets covered. You can still use it like a traditional blade. Yes. You can often utilize it as a standard direct laryngoscopy tool. That provides a really important safety net. Good to know. Okay, let's shift focus a bit from the individual provider's performance to the system around the patient, the team. How does video laryngoscopy potentially improve the team approach during intubation and maybe even teaching? Ah, this is another significant advantage. It creates instant shared situational awareness. How so? Because the entire team, the nurses, the respiratory therapists, other physicians, they can all visualize the procedure on the screen simultaneously. Right. Everyone sees what the intubator sees. Exactly. And this allows for concurrent actions and real-time corrections. People can anticipate needs better. So that shared view enables immediate coaching or assistance. Team members could offer really precise, real-time suggestions. That's correct. They could say, okay, suction right there, or help coordinate the application of, say, cricoid pressure or... Like the BURP maneuver. Exactly. The BURP technique that's backwards, upwards, rightwards pressure. Being able to see the vocal cords on screen helps the assistant apply that external pressure at just the right moment to optimize the view. It definitely improves success rates, especially in difficult airways. The training implications seem massive there too. What does the data show regarding novice success rates with each technique? People just learning. Yeah, for personnel who are untrained or have minimal experience, the video laryngoscopy tools seem to provide an enormous advantage. How big an advantage? In one study looking at untrained personnel using a specific device, the GlideScope. Okay. 
they achieved a success rate of 93%. 93% for novices with video laryngoscopy. That's impressive. And what was the success rate for those same untrained personnel using the classic direct laryngoscopy blade? It was only 51%. 51%. Wow, that comparison is dramatic. 93 versus 51. It is. Video laryngoscopy fundamentally seems to lower the barrier to entry for gaining competency. And uh, it also allows experienced clinicians to actually teach novice physicians during real resuscitation procedures. Seeing it live on the screen together. Right. Which is just invaluable for training. Okay. So the evidence really does establish that competence needs to be maintained in both tools, doesn't it? They clearly serve different but equally critical purposes, depending on the clinical scenario. Yes, I think the conclusion is pretty clear. Both techniques are mandatory. They're both highly valuable, just in different contexts. Right. Video laryngoscopy seems necessary to achieve that zero serious no-flow interruption during cardiopulmonary resuscitation. That's huge. Huge safety benefit there. But direct laryngoscopy is necessary for reliable use when you encounter those contaminated airways. So the final mandate, really, for any intubator is proficiency in plan A, plan B, and maybe even plan C for any emergent environment. You absolutely must have command over both the optical, the direct approach, and the video approach. Okay, so wrapping this up then. Given that we see similar success rates for experts with both tools, but there's this definitive clinical advantage for video laryngoscopy during CPR. Mm -hmm. It really makes you wonder, doesn't it? Here's a final thought for you listening. How often should experienced providers intentionally choose to use their alternative technique, the one they might use less often day to day? Yeah, that's a great point. You know, maybe deliberately using direct laryngoscopy, sometimes even when video laryngoscopy is available, just to maintain that peak proficiency, especially for handling those less frequent but still critical contaminated airway cases. Maintaining that full skill set. Exactly. Uh. Because that sustained competence across all scenarios, that seems to be the ultimate currency here. 